Hey everyone, welcome to our lecture on Psycho. Um, this is our last official film before we really move on to our midterms, so I want you to absolutely go for it this week. When you look at the assignment, you'll notice a couple things. Just like last week, you have pretty much an open field to take this wherever you want to take it. I'm just asking that you talk about sound design at least a little bit, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Okay, Alfred Hitchcock Psycho. So much has been thought about and written every single syllable and sentence and moment of this film has been analyzed and analyzed and analyzed. Because of that, I kind of don't want to go crazy with it. When it comes to a film like Psycho or a play like Hamlet or watching Star Wars for that matter, films that have, and, and stories that have been in our culture for years and years and years and, and that have been studied and studied and studied, it's, I think it's about time, instead of learning what the people who have studied this think about and look at, I want you to take a look at the film with fresh eyes. Um, so as I say in the discussion prompt, I kind of need you uh, to look at this film for the first time, or even if you've seen it a few times, try to really think about what makes this film unique, strange, special, and how do you respond to it without worrying about what I would call the, the critical baggage, all of the ideas that you're supposed to bring to the table. Quick side note about this. Um, I'm a literature teacher probably 80% of the time, and I always have students in my class who have studied a couple stories or maybe something like Hamlet or Shakespeare in high school and they were told it means a certain thing a certain way. And then they come to my class and I cannot convince them that there are other ways of thinking about this. Um, and it drives me kind of crazy because the whole goal is to sort of teach you skills so that you can read something new inside of these stories, not just understand what someone told you it says or it means, etc. Which is why spark notes and all that stuff is just evil, absolute crap that you should never look at ever. Anyways, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Couple things to think about just to sort of help you follow the, the film along in terms of how it works. First thing, this film comes out in 1960, just a couple years after the novel by Robert Block. Um, so this is just like um, we have maybe a Harry Not Potter novel. I can't speak. A Harry Potter novel comes out, and then in a couple years, we get an adaptation of it. That's kind of what Hitchcock was doing. He was looking for a gothic horror story that was contemporary, for his mind, in his world, that he wanted to see if he could really do something with. Um, the topic, the title of the film, is something we probably should think about a little bit. Why not psychotic? Why psycho? Um, was that we use that as sort of a derogatory term thrown around like crazy. From my understanding, in the 1950s and 60s, it wasn't meant as such a bullet. It wasn't meant as such uh, an instantaneous derogatory term. It was more meant as a way to start thinking about what does it mean to be psychotic? What does it actually mean to have a certain break with your cognitive sensibilities? What does it mean to have a part of you that not only you can't reach and can't understand normal unconscious stuff or subconscious stuff, um, but another personality that's working inside of you in some way? Um, does something new come out if you get drunk on a Friday night? Does a different version of yourself emerge around your grandmother uh, that doesn't emerge anywhere else? So the word psycho actually is resonating in all those sorts of ways, but also it resonates against the term normal, right? To have points of view or incorrect feelings. We say that about sociopaths. Um, they don't feel about things appropriately. I have no idea what's an appropriate thing to feel about certain things. Um, so. Psycho is asking us to think about, again, psychology a little bit. Okay, the film itself, it absolutely rearranged the way movie theaters work. Before Psycho, films would be playing all day long back, right back to back. So you'd go see Black Panther or something, and you'd have no idea when Black Panther starts because no one cares. You walk in, you pay your ticket, you eat your ice cream, get your popcorn or whatever you're going to eat and drink in there. You walk in, the film's an hour into the film. You watch the last hour, and then you stay for the first hour when it restarts, and then you leave. That's how films were done. With Hitchcock's Psycho, as a sort of a marketing ploy, he said, I only want people loud in at the very beginning. You cannot begin to watch this movie after it started. Also, he had almost a gag order, and there were signs all over the place um, throughout the movie theaters that would say, you are not allowed to talk about this film after you leave here right? You, you do not ruin this for your friends because the ending was so miraculous and so surprising and so unique. Uh, they didn't want that to be dulled or ruined. So this is the film that literally created the idea of watching movies front to back, studying them intensely as is, um, not just seeing them as background entertainment, but really as, as works of art. Um, so that's just a little bit of background on the concept of Psycho and the film itself. Now, 
how to start dealing with sound design and the other moments in the film you might want to spend some time analyzing and thinking about. You might not realize it as you're watching the film. The score is entirely of strings, um, violins. It might actually be all violins and cellos, um, but even if there's a viola or something, it's it's all strings. And there's so there's, there's a certain monotone, m monochromatic, one tone, one color vision of the sound of this movie, kind of on purpose. Um, no matter what's happening in the movie, the film's score typically sounds violent. You'll uh, The second you hit play, you're going to hear these violins and you're going to feel like you're being stabbed. Um, and, and that's one of the main sort of goals of that score is to unsettle everything, to make you feel like even driving around a beautiful day in, in, in the middle of Arizona, um, there's something dangerous around the corner, maybe something dangerous inside you uh, as you drive around, etc. So pay attention to the sound and the music, very, very cool stuff. Some images uh, that pop up throughout the film, uh, obviously we get showers a lot. Some of you are probably familiar with the shower scene of Psycho. It's considered one of the most sort of popular three or four minutes of cinema ever created. Um, so please watch out for, but, but for that scene, but also the idea of showers, about being cleansed, about washing away the day, about having a space that's supposed to be utterly private. I don't know about you guys, I say things in the shower I probably wouldn't say the rest of the day. Um, you might even hear me singing, which is something you will not hear me doing anywhere outside of, of the shower. Um, you know what I mean? So the space of the shower becomes very, very important. And the space of the bathroom becomes important. This is also, I'm sorry for the dumb trivia, it's the first toilet that was ever filmed in a Hollywood movie. Uh, because people somehow thought that toilets were, were filthy or dirty or somehow suggested something that the, the viewing audience wouldn't want to see. And Hitchcock, in his kind of F you to the censors in the movie industry, we watch something, not we just don't, don't just see a toilet, we see something flushed down the toilet. This is how provocative he was. Um, it's not feces or urine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did not want to set you guys up to be like, this is the best movie ever. You get to watch shit flush right down a toilet. It's kind of not what the film is doing. Uh, sorry for a little story about that there. Anyways, so the bathroom, but think about the bathroom. It's the most private room in the house. It's if you find yourself getting sick, if you find yourself realizing, holy shit, there's some more gray hair coming in. What am I going to do? You find those things out in the bathroom. Um, and there's even a moment where one of our main characters is describing a motel room for somebody and he gestures to the bathroom and he says, and there's the, because uh, the idea of what happens in the bathroom, that there's nakedness in the bathroom, that there's sexual vulnerability in the bathroom. Um, it's so unnerving to this one character. He can't even say the word bathroom, uh, not in front of a pretty girl. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay. Bathrooms, showers, toilets become important sort of metaphors, uh, throughout the film. Cars also become very important. One of the main plot points of this film is a woman trading in her car for a different car. Um, so what does it mean to have a certain vehicle to uh, be able to leave, to be able to transport yourself, to be able to escape, to be able to transform and go somewhere else? In the first half hour of the film, there's probably an eight minute, I think, car ride. Um, and it becomes a really provocative, important metaphor and symbol throughout the film. Uh, stairs become important. You're gonna see people go up and down stairs, left and right. Um, sometimes they'll go upstairs, sometimes downstairs. Sometimes they'll have to use stairs to get to a home or a house. That sort of becomes metaphoric and interesting. All right, let's start bringing this down a little bit more specifically. I had to put the pen down to get serious. Houses and motels. Houses are typically seen as private and personal. Uh, your house is your psychology. I, a lot of Gothic literature talks about this. Like, uh, the, the ground floor, this is the social place. This is where you put on your public face and you can sort of leave in and out. Downstairs, the basement, <laughs> in this film, the fruit cellar. Um, and there is a, a sort of a joke about this, that the fruit cellar is where the, the fruitiness, the craziness is. Um, to go downstairs, that maybe subconscious urges, unconscious desires, his secrets you want to hide from yourself, you would put downstairs. And then upstairs, I don't know, maybe better self, maybe the mind, maybe just a different place. You want to lock up certain ideas, certain voices, certain parts of yourself, etc. So you take that where everything's decorated individualistically, etc. And then you have the motel, a home away from home designed to kind of be utterly paper cutter, um, utterly cookie cutter. Utterly, uh, you, uh, not unique, uh, utterly, what's what I'm looking for? I'm sorry. I keep saying utterly, I'll stop. Um, 
pre-planned, pre-figured, et cetera. So if your psychology, if the house is your individual psychology, your family psychology, your way of thinking and being as a unique person, the motel is where everyone's life becomes 100% identical. Um, a lot of people, so they read the motel as the kind of culture's version of trying to put you into a mold. This is what a man is, this is what a woman is, this is what a worker is, this is what an American is in these little pre-cut boxes versus the house. You're gonna see in the film, there's the Bates Motel, which is that public face of the world. And then there's some crooked steps and a big ass hill, and then this dark, scary, gothic house. And that's the actual identity. So those two things, the public persona versus who you are at home, the film really asks us to deal with that. in some pretty, I think, provocative, cool uh, ways. So motel versus house. We're also gonna get a lot of eyes, a lot of gazes. Um, a lot of images that look like eyes, even the drain of the bathtub looks like an eye. Living eyes, we're going to see a dead eye staring at the camera, and the camera's going to twist away in a very provocative way. Um, the idea of not just being looked at, but the idea of seeing. The very first shot of the film um, is going to be a camera that sort of has this broad, open, panoramic view of a city. And it's going to look at everything, and then it's going to zoom in, literally through the blinds, into a hotel room where we see two half-naked people talking. The idea is that we're not supposed to be in here. This is not meant for me. This is a private moment. I'm intruding. And as the camera's going in, at least in 1960, maybe not so much today with the way we use cameras and share images of ourselves all over the place, it was kind of creepy. Like, Alfred and Hitchcock, don't bring me into this hotel room. This is where people go to have noontime sex when they're not married. And this is, this is a thing that I shouldn't be looking at. No, he brings the camera right in. Um, and we see these two people talking about their private lives and histories and stuff. Um, so we're going to see a lot of this. We're going to see peeping Tom sort of situations. We're going to see people looking at things they shouldn't look at. Um, and one of my favorite sequences is um, of a woman driving away. So she's in her car, and there's the rearview mirror. And she's looking in the rearview mirror, and of course there's going to be a cop in that rearview mirror. We'll talk about cops in a second. As she's driving away, I don't want to get too specific, she's done something she's worried about. She's very anxious. And as she's driving forward, instead of looking forward, she's looking at the rear of the mirror. So if you can think about the metaphor of that, instead of looking at today and tomorrow and where I'm going to go, I'm going to obsess about what I just did. And I'm going to keep looking backwards. And the metaphor is pretty cool, right? I cannot see my life and I cannot see where I'm going because I'm so obsessed with the rear of the mirror. And you're going to hear her play out in her mind what she thinks people are saying about her. Um, and then, of course, there's a cop in the rearview mirror, right? Uh, and that becomes the second thing to think out, think through. There's a lot of people staring at each other in the film. One of them is a cop. Think about what the cop is trying to do. Try to both think about it from the guilty person's conscious. What does it mean to see a cop following you? But also think about what we actually see in the movie. This cop, I kind of giggle. I think it's hysterical. Um, he doesn't do anything. He follows this woman around and there are many shots of like the woman driving away and then the cop walking up behind her and it feels totally ominous and the cop you know stares doesn't do anything when the cop does have lines he acts like we would hope a cop acts how are you you seem nervous is everything okay can i do anything to help you <laughs> so the cop is actually really helpful really nice but he's a terrifying figure it's our main character and it might have something to do with his mirrored sunglasses. That when we look at the authority figure, we don't see the authority figure, we see ourselves looking back at us. We see our own judgments, our own insecurities, and that's why we might be terrified of folks in authority. So that's kind of funny. But it also might be a sort of judgment about the potential impotence of law and order. Uh, we put so much responsibility on law and order. Do they work uh, the way we want them to, the way they're supposed to? And what, how might Hitchcock be playing with um, those ideas about authority and sort of kicking back against authority? Last um, image and idea I want to talk about here uh, is probably one of the weirdest, and that's birds. You're going to see a lot of birds, a lot of conversation about birds, about what birds eat, uh, etc. And that becomes a metaphor. I'm sorry to be a little sort of gross, but stuffing birds becomes kind of a metaphor for maybe sexuality or, or, or an inability to deal with one's own sexual desires or something like that. Um, there's a scene with some birds that hopefully you'll watch it over and over again. Everything from where the birds are positioned, are they stuffed birds, are they painting of birds, um, who's in front of the birds, how do they look. There's a beautiful image of our main character um, 
looking like he has, he's almost a demon with these owl wings sort of floating outside of his back. And it's just the way the shot is constructed, the visual design of that shot. Um, so please watch out for that stuff. All those tiny little hints, those subtle, subtle suggestions are actually pretty provocative, pretty powerful, and pretty important throughout the film. Um, last thing, I'm sorry, I always have 10 last things. There's a shot of someone falling down the stairs. And again, I'm trying to be coy, I'm trying not to give everything away. It's one of the coolest, strangest, most awkward, goofy shots. Um, take a look at that and see how that might ask you to feel a certain way. And then, of course, the very last thing. The film closes with a psychiatrist explaining to the audience everything that went before. And in the, the writing of the script, um, one of the writers, uh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I forget his last name. Joseph is his first name. Um, was undergoing what we would call Freudian psychoanalysis, discussing issues of childhood, discussing issues of dreams, trying to figure out the problems with your parents and how they might prefigure the problems you have in the world. Uh, and he said that he wanted a psychiatrist to talk the way his psychiatrist talked. So the intention of that psychiatrist is to truly offer an intellectual, cool point of view to the audience. Contemporary viewers of this film tend to think that, that psychiatrist is a dangerous, loony, whack job who is oversimplifying the film and trying to tell us to think something that we shouldn't think. So I'm very interested to hear what you might think about that psychiatrist's role. Have fun with this film. Try to see it through fresh eyes. Uh, I can't wait to sort of figure out where you guys go with this, what you want to think about, uh, etc. If you have any questions, go ahead, please ask me. I'm happy to sort of talk more about anything specific in the film. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you in the discussion boards.